David, King David. And how many know the story about Goliath, David killing Goliath? Give me a wave if you know that story, David and Goliath. Here's my premise. Goliath was not the only giant that David faced. And so often we think David fought Goliath and that's the biggest giant. There were big giants in between. And that's what I'm preaching today. The giants in between. The giants in between. 1 Samuel 16, 12 to 13. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint young David, for this is the future king of Israel. David has been anointed king. Then Samuel, the prophet at the time, prophets and kings would always work together. Samuel took the horn of oil, representing the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and he anointed him. They would literally pour oil head to toe. I mean, this guy would be dripping with oil. He'd be like flicking his hair. He? he anointed him in the midst of his brothers. You know where they've been vexed, right? Why the youngest? Why little David? And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Come on, what a victory scripture, right? David is anointed king. Most scholars agree he's about 15 years of age. He's the youngest in the family. He's chosen for his heart. He's anointed as the king of Israel. He's empowered for his task. And you would think reading that scripture that that would be it. Get him a robe. Get him to sign a contract. Give him a million dollars. Come on, somebody. Throw a party. I'm on my way to the palace. You'd think that David, would, after being anointed king, that would be incredible. But how many know there was a big gap between David being anointed and him being appointed? David was anointed here when he was 15. You're going to be the king of Israel. But there was a 15 year gap until he actually sat on the throne. There was a gap between being anointed and being appointed. And that gap was 15 years. And I am preaching about that gap. Because a lot of people, even here tonight, don't survive that gap. The gap is, there are giants in between that gap. When you're waiting for God to move. When he hasn't done what you were hoping. Where you're trusting God for the future that God has promised you. And there are battles in between. You know what the battles are filled with? Obstacles. Is anyone going through facing obstacles here tonight? Challenges to God's destiny. Challenges to getting to be the king. He's anointed king. And yet there's a 15 year battle of giants in between to get to where God has promised. There are obstacles on the way to successful business. There are challenges on the way to successful marriage. Come on, somebody. There are roadblocks all the way through the plans of God. And I call them giants in between. Because Goliath wasn't the only giant David faced. And you know what? I believe there's people facing them here. I prayed. I seek God all week praying, God, what do you want me to preach to your people? There are people here. And God has told you you're going to be married one day. But there's a big long gap of singleness. <laughs> And there's obstacles in between called temptation. And that guy who keeps texting me, come on somebody. And that girl who keeps turning up, come on somebody, being real. There are challenges in between from going from being single to being married. There are challenges, there are giants in between. Sometimes you're a disciple. God has given you a word that you're going to be used powerfully in church and in the kingdom. But you haven't really come to where you know God wants you to be. How many know that gap can be filled with challenges and obstacles? Sometimes you're unemployed and you know you can succeed. You know there's a job ahead of you, but there's delay in between. There's challenge, there's giants in between. Sometimes you can be in bondage. You're struggling with gambling. You're struggling with alcohol. You're struggling with pornography. You're struggling with with smoking, or you're struggling with real issues in life that no one dare talk about. 
And you know the Bible says there's freedom, but there's a, obstacles in the way, battles to face to get you to what the Bible says is the promise of freedom. Do you understand what I'm preaching? I'm preaching about that gap. Here's the first giant. I'm going to give you three giants. Number one. Giant number one is the giant of delay. How many like delay? Listen, I'm the most impatient guy you're going to find. Amen. I repent, Father. Hallelujah. I do not have that anointing. Amen. God has taught me. Amen. Over the years, amen. It's just, just, you can't get ahead of me. But I'm not naturally patient. And I don't think many of you are either, maybe, because some of you are smiling at me. Delay is a giant. We talk about Goliath. David defeated. Do you know what he also defeated? Delay. He was chosen, anointed, empowered. And guess what happens after all of that fanfare? Oil on his hair. He's flicking his hair in front of his brother saying, I'm the future king. Guess what happens? Nothing. Turn to your neighbor and say, I hate nothing. Come on. Nothing happens. In fact, it goes worse. It gets worse. He's 15 years old when he's anointed as king. And he's 30 years old when he's appointed and sitting on the throne. That's a 15 year delay. If you're going to get to where God wants you to be, you've got to stand against the giant of delay. We wait for jobs. We wait for things to change. We wait for something to happen. We wait for husbands to catch a revelation or wives to get saved. We wait for visions to be fulfilled. Can I encourage you, church? God will bring it to pass. Habakkuk 2 verse 3 says these words in the Living Bible. The things I plan won't happen right away. For those of you who are like me and impatient, underline those words. But slowly, steadily, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, don't despair tonight. For these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. Can I encourage you tonight, church? And I'm here to encourage you to conquer that demon and take its head off. And that giant in between, that giant of delay is that God will bring to pass what he's promised over your life in due time. Don't let delay discourage you. Look out through the Bible. Abraham waited 25 years for a son. Israel waited 40 years in the wilderness to get to Canaan. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is one page in my Bible representing 400 years called the silent years. Listen, even when Jesus came upon the earth, he had to wait till he was 30. Amen? Why? Because the truth is, there's no easy steps to maturity. Oh, ouch, amen. There are no easy steps to maturity. We have to learn things and become something and let go of things. And it's a journey. And if you're still waiting, God's doing something in your life. Come on, shout amen even louder. Amen. There's no secrets to instant sainthood. I wish when I got saved, amen, that I sprouted wings and I flew out the church, amen. An angel of God, I did not, amen. The next night I got saved, I went to a party, amen. Can of beer in my hand, cigarette in my hand, not even knowing the decision I'd made. And God began to convict me that I can't live that life anymore. Come on, somebody. I've got to do right, I've got to do this. And, you know, God began, but listen, there are no secrets. I had to, I was delayed to becoming all God wanted me to be. There's no pop-up perfect marriages. And all the married people said, amen. amen. On the altar, he looked beautiful, she looked beautiful. Oh, you got on one knee weeks before and it was amazing. But then you move in together and he's selfish and she snores and you know, he doesn't pick his pants up and he's a bit grumpy. And she gets tired after work and come on somebody, there's no pop-up perfect marriages because the truth is things take time. But don't let delay discourage you. Amen. If you're meant to be together, God will bring it to pass. Things will change. Life will be together. Life will get good again. Amen. You know giant oak trees? You see these enormous oak trees. In England, you see huge, you know, like tree trunk, like massive. And then you see next to them little mushrooms. Not magic mushrooms. Little mushrooms. Amen. Giant oaks take hundreds of years to grow. That stability 
And that strength takes hundreds of years. But you know, a mushroom can pop up overnight. Are you going to be an oak Christian? Or a mushroom? Touch your neighbor and say these words. Say, I'm not a mushroom Christian. Some of you are like, what in the world is he talking about? If you just lost concentration, we think about dinner, amen. Let me say it again. Oaks take hundreds of years, mushrooms pop overnight. You need to be an oak Christian, amen. I, it takes time to grow that stability and that strength and that wisdom in ministry and all those different things. But don't let delay make you feel like you're not going to get to where God wants you to be. David was anointed at 15 years of age and a 15 year way he gets to the throne but he still got to the throne. It took 15 long hard years but he got there. Great men and women are grown in struggles, storms and seasons that seem and often to go on for too long. But the Bible says, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be mature like an oak and complete. God's doing something in your life, my friend. It's not delay. Don't let delay discourage you. Listen, delay is not denial. Delay is not denial. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Come on, somebody. God is faithful and a God who is transcendent outside of time can never be late. That's good theology right there. Can God ever be late? Impossible. Because he dwells outside of time. The giant number two is the giant of discouragement. David had to battle 15 years delay, but he also had to battle discouragement. I don't know how you walked in today, but I know many people battle discouragement. 1 Samuel 17, 8 to 11, we're looking at David now. He's been anointed already, and his big battle, physical battle, is a battle with Goliath. Verse 8 says, Goliath stood and shouted, taunted across the Israelites, why are you coming out to fight, he called. I'm a Philistine champion, <clears throat> and you are the servants of Saul, who was the previous king. Choose one man to come down and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves, but if I kill him, you will be our slaves. He stands in his face and he says, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Verse 16. For 40 days. Everyone say 40. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israel army. I'm talking about discouragement. For 40 days and nights, Philistine, the enemy of God, it represents the enemy of the Christian life, the enemy of the kingdom of God, was taunting, shouting, intimidating for 40 days. The number 40 in the Bible is always synonymous with testing. 40 is the number for testing. So when you look at the scripture, much more is happening. What's happening is their faith in God was being tested by an enemy. And he was taunting them saying, you can't win this battle. You'll never make it. It's over. And he was challenging them. And I call this enemy discouragement. He's trying to, he says, I defy the armies of Israel. You ever heard those voices that say you're a bad Christian? That you'll never become anything. You'll never get free. You're not good enough. People don't like you. There are taunts that come. Can I encourage you, church, or remind you? Often discouragement comes by listening to the wrong voice. It says for 40 days, every morning and night, he was strutting and he was shouting this nagging discouragement at Israel. Just picture it. You know, I think about people that go home tonight. Tomorrow morning, you wake up and you hear that nagging voice. You don't tell everyone, because in church we turn up and pretend everything's cool and we look and amen. But the nagging voice that speaks to you in the morning, not good enough, you're a failure, you're a terrible Christian, people don't like you, you've done nothing right, your decisions, that were there. you've ruined everything. This nagging voice, about 40 days, morning and night. You know when I open the papers and I listen to the news, listen, I, I read some of the most negative things, right? You know, constantly the world is falling apart, 
I get it, there's troubles and struggles and you know, disease is everywhere and there's gonna be massive war and, and apparently Islam's growing faster, amen, and, and born again Christians are decreasing. I don't believe that, amen. Because God is faithful and he said he'll build his church, amen. I don't believe that. But when you open the paper and you listen to the news, you get a lot of voices messaging, saying you're too ugly, amen, you're not rich enough, amen, that you're this, you're that, the world is negative, it's not worth going to church, no point living for God, you'll never get where you're meant to be, listen, it's a lie, and you need to stop listening to the wrong voices, your unsaved friends who don't know Christ should not be telling you how to live for God, someone shout amen, amen. people around you who, who, who have no regard for the things of God, should not be telling you this and that about different things. You should be listening to this voice. The voice of God written down. Why written? So that every single day you could read the words of God. The enemy of God is constantly speaking morning and night. Trying to discourage David and Israel. So here's my question. Who are you listening to? Goliath or God? Because your giant is going to talk. The giant of discouragement is going to speak. This will never work. Amen. This, that, and the other. You've got to make a choice to say, I'm not listening to Goliath. I am listening to God. Because you know what Goliath will do, right? He'll take your current courage and he'll diss it. You know those words, diss? You ever heard the words diss it? You take courage and you diss it. You get discouraged. So someone taught me years ago, I was like, that's quite true. You take my courage and you start dissing my courage. Why do you believe in God? Why are you still going to church? Why are you being faithful to your ministry? No one listens to you. You're not doing a great job. Come on, parents feel it. Your kids at times diss you. You're a terrible parent. You don't do what? Kids, sometimes your parents diss you. You'll be nothing, amen. Or maybe they don't, but people in the world, some people don't have Christian parents all the time, amen. We live in different families, at times dysfunctional. We all have different things going on in our families. But listen to me, don't let your courage be dis, so you become discouraged. Fear is contagious, but so is faith. That's why tonight, did you see the worship team giving all their heart, playing and singing? Because right there, before service, we said, you know what? We feel people just need their faith lifted. Amen? So let's sing with passion and play with passion. They did an awesome job, amen? But you know why? Because faith is contagious. And if you and I want to be children of God and do something for God as a team, as a church, as individuals, we need to cultivate an atmosphere of faith, not fear. Of courage, not discourage. Don't come and tell me what's going wrong. Don't come and tell me what needs changing in the group. Hey, come on, somebody. Don't come and tell me what you would do. And listen, let's have faith in here. Let's have courage in here. Nothing's going to be perfect, but how many know we must protect ourselves from discouragement? And may I just encourage you, don't discourage each other. Be careful what we say to each other. David listened to God, not Goliath, and he won. The third giant, doubt. Doubt. First Samuel 17, 32, 33. David basically stepped up to this Goliath and he's like, right, I'll take it on. Because he's a man of God. And he's a man of faith. Doesn't have anything really as a warrior. Just as God. But that's enough. And he says, don't worry about this for the sign David told Saul, this young man. I'll go and fight him. I love that spirit. May that spirit be in our ministry. Amen. We don't have what it takes. But let's have a go. Saul said, don't be ridiculous. Some of you applied for things and tried things and... And the enemy said, don't be ridiculous. You couldn't do this. You can start your own business. You can start your own ministry. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. Doubt. You're a boy. And he's a man of war since his youth. Do you hear the doubt? Do you hear the doubt being sown in? Which is why you must never put down someone's idea. Come on, somebody. In church, in team, when so you must breed confidence and courage. Because you never know what might happen. Saul was an expert warrior. He'd been in war all his life, yet he doubted David's ability. Do you know, I remember pioneer, pioneering in the UK. And I was full of faith in God. And we hadn't started the church yet in 2009. And 
I remember chatting to a woman over Chinese meals. She was a friend of the family. And I said, yeah, I'm leaving my career. Lisa's leaving teaching. We're going to go and pioneer in England. We're going to start a church. She said, how are you going to do it? I said, well, just the two of us. And she said, don't be ridiculous. Amen. Two of you, how can two of you start a work for God? And she said these words. And how many know, you've got to just sometimes dust those words off. She meant, well, maybe, or maybe not. Sometimes the enemy speaks to different people, right? And in my spirit, I thought, listen, you can doubt me. Fine. But don't doubt Jesus, amen. God will do this. And 10 years passed by. Ministry grows. Revival happens. Church is a planet. It was a fruitful, fruitful church. She was wrong. But doubt will come. People will say, you can't do it. There's not enough money. There's not enough space. There's not enough resources in the world. You don't have the power or the skill or the talent or the education. Listen, the enemy knows the worst thing about doubt is you can doubt yourself. That's all he needs to, you to do. He sows a seed and then he leaves you to destroy yourself. Isn't that right? He sows a seed. You're not up to this task. You begin to say, I can't do this. Am I capable of doing what God wants me to do? Can I become that man or woman of God? Can I do this? Listen, yes you can. Because if you're called, God will equip you in Jesus' name. That's the testimony of David. He was a boy. No war training bar is slain. And yet he defeated Goliath when everyone doubted him. Don't let people doubt you, my friend. I don't doubt you. Would you just turn to your neighbor and say, I don't doubt you. Come on, say it, say it, say it to the person behind you, say, I believe in you. Amen. Some of you have never heard that. Listen, I believe in you. I believe in your power, the power of, uh, to do ministry through Jesus. I believe in what God can do through your life. You may not be where you want to be, but you're certainly not who you used to be in Jesus' name. Okay, the question is how? How do I defeat these giants? I told you what the three giants were, right? How do I defeat them really quickly? Because it's really warm. And you're all going to... Wills on me. Start yawning. Number one, encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself in the Lord. David gets no encouragement from his brothers, his dad. No one cheered him on. No one sent him a text message. No one tweeted, I'm so happy for David. Everyone was waiting to see what would happen. In fact, the king sarcastically said to him when he went to kill Goliath, he went, well, the Lord be with you. You know, that sarcastic comment. Well, yeah, you have a go. A few people have tried. You have a go. I've heard, I hear those in ministry all the time. The truth is, David, David needed to encourage himself. In the, what do you do when no one believes in you? 1 Samuel 30 verse 6, it says, David encouraged himself in, his Lord, in the Lord his God. Sometimes there's no one to encourage you. Sometimes the boss won't say you're brilliant at work. Sometimes you get no credit. Sometimes, you, sometimes people in ministry don't give you the cheer. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes it doesn't work. But can I encourage you? Find a place before God. Put some worship on. Remember what he's done for you. Begin to lift your voice and praise him. Confess the promises. Pray. Fast. Speak in tongues. That's what I was doing before service, right? Trying to get you to audibly use that faith to say, God, I believe you. So the voice of your faith is louder than the shouts of fear that are coming against you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. The days when I'm down and, and upset and crying and I feel like, listen, I've got to get before God on my knees and say, God, help us. Help me. I've got to seek God's face sometimes on my own. Young man, young woman, get before God and say, Lord. I'm going to find myself some courage here this morning, this night, in Jesus' name. Number two. So number one, encourage yourself in God. However that is for you, whether it be worship music or for me, I'll put some worship on and I'll speak in tongues and I'll begin to thank God. I'll write gratitude lists, whatever works. And encourage yourself in the Lord. Number two, remember how God has helped you in the past. There's so much about remembrance in the Bible. There's so much about remembrance. The Bible even says the Holy Spirit has come to remind you. You know why? Because we're forgetful. We forget what God's done. We forget he's been so faithful and so good and so kind and he's delivered us and saved. We sometimes forget that the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, 
It says that when David is coming up against the Philistine, verse 37, he says, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You know what he said? He said, listen, yeah, I'm facing something big. Something I've never faced before. But you know what? God has helped me with a bear before. God has helped me with a lion before. And you know what? He helped me then and he's going to help me now. You've got to remember what God has done in your past. He saved you. He can save you again. He freed you. He can free you again. He blessed you. He can bless you again. Remember how he's helped you in the past. You know the truth is, the only thing that changes often in life is the size of our opposition, but never the size of our God. I'll say it again. When you go through life, what changes as a Christian it's the size of the opposition. But what never changes is the size of your God. God is always powerful. He is the ancient of days. He is unchanging. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. You will face things that have varying degree of power. But God has always remained capable. And you need to remind yourself that He is still that God. Amen? Amen. Okay. Let's wind this down. Number three. Yes, remember how God has helped you in the past, but expect God to help you in the future. This is about faith. If you haven't worked it out, the Christian life lives and hinges on faith. Everything is about God strengthening faith. David is a man of faith. He didn't just reference what God had done in his past. He believed God could help him in his future. He believed God, Goliath could be taken down. First Samuel 17, 45 says, I'll cut down to verse 46. It says, David's declaring, listen to his words. This day, the Lord will. No one say will. He could hear him. He's confident. He's about to take on a giant of war. Philistines are trained killers. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will. Everyone say will. will. He says, I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give your carcass of the your carcasses of the camp to the Philistines, to the birds of the air. It's a bit rough, David, amen. Verse 47. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear. Amen. With money or academia or your own power for the battle is the Lord's and what he will he will he will give you into our hands do you expect God to work for your future can I just defend God for a moment why should God do anything for us that we don't expect him to do right it's almost like we limit God because we don't expect it. Listen, you've got to expect God to help you in your future. What are you expecting God to do for you? You know how I can prove what you're expecting God to do for you? By asking you to show me your prayer list. I could look at some prayer lists. You could look at my prayers and I could see whether you're really expecting God to move for you. Or whether prayers are tiny and small or you're tired or you're weary. Listen, pray audacious prayers. Pray things that are beyond reach. Go for things that are far beyond because the Bible says our ways are not His ways. His ways are far higher and greater, right? He said He could do more than we even think or ask. Imaginably more. You can't even conceive what God can do. This is not emotion. This is faith. David said, God will move for me. I don't know when, delay. I don't know how discouragement will come. But you know what? God will move. God will do what you expect Him to do. Often at times no more or no less. I find that quite scary. God will often do what you expect Him to do. Sometimes no more and no less. As in, He will do more. But what I mean is, He often allows you to use faith. He stirs your faith so that you'll step out that little bit further. And then He answers that and He affirms it was good for you to have that faith. But so often, he will allow what we expect. If you just expect this kind of level, then you may just get that level. My challenge is to think beyond that and say, I'm going to expect God for a greater future. 
I'm not saying you've got to expect God, you know, God made me win the lottery, etc., etc. He'll do, you know, he'll do what's within his will. But you've got to live with faith. Faith for your future. Faith is the currency for miracles. Isn't that what the Bible says? The just shall live by faith. Not power, not academia, not your own desires, by faith. It's not what you think you can do. It's what we know what God can do. How, are you expecting for God to move in your life? I am. I want you to be. Psalm 62 verse 5 says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is on Him. Amen. What are you expecting God to do? It's internal. It's separate. I'm expecting it. It's going to come. Expect God to help you in the future. I'm going to close on this. There's a thing called the Via della Rosa, which is basically in Jerusalem. It's a route that Jesus took to carry the cross. And like many religious sites, you know, they've set up stations everywhere of this Via della Rosa, which is basically a street in Jerusalem. It's known as the way of suffering. And it's, it's a route that Jesus took when he carried his cross. And there's, if you go there now, and I've been there, down that route, there's 14 stations that represent what he went through. You know, drop, dropping his cross, sweating blood, someone picking his cross up for him, the place where he was whipped, the crown of thorns placed on his head, the place where he fell, the place where he was nailed, the place where he died. And you look at this kind of journey, it's like you're journeying on the giants in between. It's like Jesus, this is Jesus' journey, right? He went from the crowds, people preaching the gospel, to the cross, and then to the crown, right? He went from the crowds, to the cross, to the crown where he rose again. But there were so many giants in between that journey. For you to go from being anointed and appointed, for being what God has promised you to getting a fulfillment, from going from the cross or the crown to the crown and the glory. Listen, there's going to be giants in between. And what Jesus had to do was overcome his giants. He had to, the journey, and the truth is, this is our path. Our path is a path filled with giants in between. Delay, discouragement, and doubt. They're like the thorns on Jesus' head and then being whipped and then dropping his cross and then being there. All these things he had to overcome to get to sitting at the right hand of God. You follow me, church? But he overcame them and gave you the power to overcome your giants too. You're going to journey in life and there's going to be giants delay, doubt or discouragement and doubt. But God, Jesus Christ, has overcome his and he's going to give you power to overcome yours. There are giants that you're facing right now, but they're in between. Remember, they're not the end. Say those words, say they're not the end. Say it louder, one, two, three. They're not the end. You're on a journey. Don't fall right there. Overcome that sin. Overcome that thing. Overcome that doubt. Overcome that past. And keep moving and you will come to where you're meant to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I pray for you? Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight.